Today we're here to set the river free. At 10 o'clock this morning, March 5th, Interior Secretary Dirk Kenthorne pushed a button that opened a series of jet tubes below the Glen Canyon Dam and started a 60-hour high-flow experiment. The Secretary's action marked the start of an interagency research effort led by the U.S. Geological Survey to study and improve Colorado River resources in the Grand Canyon National Park. I met with USGS experts to get the inside scoop on this high-flow experiment. I'm Andrea Alpine. I'm the center director for the Southwest Biological Science Center of the U.S. Geological Survey. I oversee the science that's conducted in the Grand Canyon. Describe for me what the opening of those jet tubes was like for you. This was amazing. I was down on the edge of the dam when the secretary opened the valves that we started with two of the bypass tubes opening us and the power that you feel coming from that is just tremendous. If you see some of these photographs, you can see how powerful that is. And it made us all there think about how this was trying to replicate what occurred in nature in the past is mm -hmm. very large flows of water that would rush down this river. And I think we were not anywhere near as high as they did in the past, but it's still you could sort of feel the power of this water and the way that it both pushes this sand and sediment up and the way it's created this canyon. For scientists, this is probably, I, I describe it as the gold standard of science experiments, where you actually get to manipulate the environment and then s measure those changes that occur as you manipulate them. That's very rare in the world to be able to do that. This is a few hours after the jet tubes have been opened. Can you tell me, are you seeing any differences in the river in the sediment so far? Yeah, it was really interesting to watch. Right away, you could start to watch the river rise. You see the river come up to much farther on the sides of it. And you started to see places where you could now see that the water changed colors. You'd see that there was sediment in the water. You start seeing places that before were um, just rocky shores start to fill up. And I think the dramatic pictures are taking some right now while they're out there. Dramatic pictures are when we're going to let this water go back down. Tell me, why are we doing this right now? Why March? So why March is a, is a question that um, lots of folks ask. And why now versus any other time? So the first part of that is that all the sediment that we get now delivered to this canyon comes from tributaries. So what used to come down the Colorado River gets stopped by the dam. Mm -hmm. So the only way we get sediment into the system now is through tributaries. What, we, what happened in the last 16 months is we've had a lot of monsoonal storms that brought a lot of sediment into the system that we haven't seen before. So now we have what we would, we're looking at two and a half to three times as much as we saw in 2004 when we did this experiment before. Mm -hmm. So you want to tie in these high flow releases to times when you have a lot of sediment in the system so you can try to, what they call it, mobilize it, means put it into the water with this high flow, and then when you let the water go down, when mm -hmm. we turn, this, turn the valves back off, that sediment will sink out and will be on the sides of the river and make these beaches. And that's what we're trying to do now. And that's why it's, we do it, do it at this time in the yearly long sequence. And in March was, is a critical part. You want to do it between January and March somewhere. For many other reasons is you don't want to go into past March. So for things like tamarisk, it's an invasive plant that grows along the sides of the river. Mm -hmm. It's not so great for the beaches to have that tamarisk on it, so we have to remove it often. It flowers right in the springtime. So you don't want to do this high pro release when it's flowering and now you would push those seeds and flowers even further than they already go. So that you have a small window of time when you want to try to do this. It does um, cause some difficulties in March for our uh, fly fishing friends. Mm -hmm. And we don't really know the effects of this on trout fishery. So this year, this, on this experiment, we've spent a great deal of time working on tagging these trout and being able to clearly figure out if they're affected by this or not. To learn more about trout tagging, I went just downstream of Glen Canyon to Lee's Ferry. There, I met with Kara Hillwig. My name is Kara Hillwig. I work for USGS, Grand Canyon Monitoring Research Center, as a fisheries biologist. I was hired to develop a non-native fish management plan for Grand Canyon. We're down here at Lee's Ferry a few hours after the uh, 
jet tubes have been opened. I'm down here monitoring the movements of fish that I've surgically implanted with sonic tags, rainbow trout specifically, to see what the effect of the flow is on rainbow trout movement. Nobody's ever done this study before, so the, all the hypotheses include they could all be washed downstream, they could all hunker down and stay right in position, or they, they may displace downstream and then gradually move back upstream. We really don't know. What are the main goals of the study, and how do they relate to the humpback chub? So there's two questions that are going to be addressed with this study, um, one of which is related to uh, the angling public. Do these fish, do these rainbow trout, wash downstream to areas that are less, uh, where they are less available to the angling public? And secondly, do these fish wash downstream into areas that are important for humpback chub? If they do wash into areas that are important for humpback chub, there may be adverse uh, effects such as um, competition or predation. However, the verdict is still out on that. We really don't know what the effect of rainbow trout on uh, humpback chub is. To put the whole high flow experiment in perspective, I asked Andre Alpine how long this experiment will last after the water is ramped down. This has really just begun. So we have the, all those hundred scientists are down on the river right now and they're making me measurements at frequencies much more rapidly than we normally do. When will we know the results? So we've, we're, we have about, I think there's eight different um, studies going, along, going on right now. So we have things from measuring the sediment and the creation of sandbars to looking at backwater habitats, what are the food resources for fish doing, how is this affecting humpback chub. So we have lots of separate studies that are going on all during this time period. Some things we will know immediately. Like as what? soon as you drop that water, we'll see sandbars created. So they'll be taking photographs that they're doing right now. So that kind of information, the part where we get to see immediate results, we'll see as soon as we let the water act down. Oh, great. Other things will take much longer. So I think that we're from today through another year, we'll be learning and collecting information, and we'll be getting that out to all the people who need to know these things, the people who make management decisions, as quickly as we can. So some things you'll know right away, and other things like what's the importance of backwater habitat to humpback chub, that will take us longer to, to decide or to, to find. And so that, it's going to be over time, we'll be getting those results out. And we'll be sure to keep you posted over time as findings are released on the HIFO experiment. That does it for this episode of CoreCast. Thanks to all of you for listening. You can learn more information about the high flow experiment by visiting gcmrc.gov and clicking on the high flow experiment tab. CoreCast is a product of the U.S. Geological Survey, Department of the Interior. Until next time, I'm Jennifer LaVista.